Psalm 73 and verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than the heart could wish. And they say, how can God know? Or is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task or too painful for me to understand until I went into the sanctuary of God. Amen. Then I discerned their end. Not until he heard the preaching of the word of God, not until he had the greatest altar call, not until he had the waters of baptism, just until he went in to the sanctuary of God. Tonight, our message is just show up. Uh, looking into the mirror, looking into your life and saying, this is what I have and this is what they have. And pride, that flesh comes up and slaps you or rebukes you and says, you're, you're foolish or you're silly or you're making... Oh, that's just a dumb decision to go after God as hard as you're going after. Because look at everything everybody else has. And that flesh came up and rebuked him every morning. And so he dealt with this. It was on his shoulders. It was on his mind. The stress, uh, the feelings of everything that he had to go through to get to the house of God, of God and live for God. Um, these things to him were, were weighing on him when he looked outside. And it was, it was, he said, my feet had almost well nigh slipped. I was almost on my way out. I was almost not going to come one more time. I was almost ready to make up my mind that this is the last time I get up, I get dressed, and I make my way down to the house of the Lord because I cannot fight this battle anymore. And when he decided to get to the house of the Lord, the Bible says everything began to make sense. Amen. Just walking in to the house of the Lord. And so when I say I'm glad you're here because we don't know what it took for you to get to the house of the Lord today. We don't know the battles you had to fight in your mind this morning. We don't know all the arguments you had this afternoon. We don't know the doubts that you've had. We don't know the feelings, the oppression you might have felt all day long, the doubts that you might have in yourself, the times, the doubts that you might, I, I don't even see the point because I might not touch God again. I haven't felt him in a while. He hasn't spoken to me the way that he used to speak to me. And I don't feel his spirit or his presence the same way anymore. And maybe these thoughts have been going through your mind or through your heart for weeks, months, years. And we don't know what it took for you to get to the house of the Lord today. But you are here. There's nothing like the house of the Lord. There's nothing like getting, uh, doing every, moving over every obstacle, obstacle, climbing every wall, running through every barbed wire to get to the house of the Lord. When I was uh, growing up in Delhi, I had a friend named Louis. I knew Louis since the fifth grade, and he was a zany, funny guy. He was known for making funny faces. He had a talent for using hilarious voices and making jokes that were far above a fifth grader's level of understanding. He made jokes uh, to teachers that only they would understand, like inside jokes. He was a silly, funny, zany guy. And he wasn't very good at anything athletic, but he was very good at making you laugh. But he was a very competitive person, and he desired to compete athletically. He wanted to be involved in sports uh, but from seventh grade to our senior year, he tried out for basketball, never made the team, never made the cut. Uh, he tried out for football, and he made the football team because everybody makes the football team. Even I could have made the football team. 
but he never played, never saw down, never saw the field. But he was a great teammate. He was always encouraging. We, we would always lose. Our, our town was always, always losing. We were never a winning town ever. And we always lost, and we got used to losing. But he would always be encouraging to his teammates, giving them pats on the back, shoulder rubs. Come on, we could do it. Hey, it's not over yet. The clock hasn't hit zero. I know we're down 70 with two minutes left, but we can do this. And he was always he was a, just an awesome teammate. And he was competitive, and he took the game and he took winning seriously, more seriously than anybody else on that team, because even though he did not play a single second, when we lost, he was more upset than anybody. He was kicking garbage cans and punching walls all the way from the field back to the locker room in his completely dry face, no sweat, and completely clean uniform. He was, he was irate. And you would have thought that he was, he was the captain of the team. But uh, he took it more seriously than anybody. And he would, he would, I would see him a lot of times leaving the field with tears in his eyes. He would be so upset and he couldn't even talk to him like, Louie, it's okay. He would just push you out of the way. And I was like, oh, well, give this guy a couple of days. But he never saw the field. And he wanted to so bad. In our junior year, Louis tried out and made the wrestling team. And that moment, Louis's life was changed. We had first period physics together, and our teacher would open up Monday mornings by asking if anyone had an eventful weekend or anything they would like to share that happened to them over the weekend. One Monday morning, Louis was sitting there with all smiles with a gold medal around his neck. Now, he got this medal for his first tournament, at wrestling. And he shared the class. He won that gold medal that Saturday morning. Now, for wrestling, if anybody knows that anybody that's been on a wrestling team, you have to be dedicated because football you got on Friday night, basketball you got Tuesday nights and Thursday nights. Wrestling is Saturday morning at like 6 to 8 a.m. And you have to travel far a lot of times. Yeah, so my brother was in wrestling. He would get up at like five, four, five in the morning, and they would drive two hours to go to their tournament. And so Louis, would, he, he found his calling in wrestling. Um, so you have to travel far, and you have to get up early. And you got to do what nobody else wants to do. Monday morning after Monday morning, Louis would show up, that morning with at least one but sometimes two gold medals around his neck and they begin to pile up around his neck and he would show them off i won another gold medal and our teacher would clap wow louis this and we'd all stand up and give him a standing ovation louis he became the most winningest uh sports athlete in school history gold medals they'd be loud and clanging over his chest he was proud of himself his mom was proud of him the entire school was proud of him there was nobody in his weight class that could match him he went on to win more than anybody could imagine and he did it all because louis was willing to do what nobody else in his weight class was willing to do we found out later that year that louis woke up earlier than his opponents he traveled farther than his opponents and he just showed up, literally. At every tournament that year, he would show up and have nobody to wrestle. And by default, he would win a gold medal. And then come in Monday morning, did it again. Undefeated. Unstoppable. Because he just showed up. And sometimes that's all it takes. We pile so much on ourselves. I got to do this. I got to get this right. I need this right. But sometimes when the doors are open, just show up to the house of the Lord. Because you don't know what he has for you. Hallelujah. You do not know what he has for you. A giant had to go down, so David showed up. I believe that 
if anybody would have stepped out there, God would have been, hey, man, this guy's talking too much stuff. I'll take anybody to just show up. And nobody would. Hiding behind rocks and bushes and David comes out to bring Lunchables. I'll show up. Runs out to the field and a giant went down that day because David showed up. Billy Cole would preach. He would go to Thailand and they would have thousand souls revival, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 people getting the Holy Ghost everywhere he went. And they would ask him, how, do you, how is it that, that where you show up, the Holy Ghost is poured out and God moves and there's these, you have uh, uh, an experience or a, a reputation. You have, uh, what do you call it, a resume of just revival after revival, thousands and thousands of souls. And he would say, well, I ask God where he's going to do it, and then I just show up. It was going to happen whether or not he showed up, but I just got to get there. I got to get involved. The spirit that we felt here today, the move that we felt here today, it was for everybody. It was for every one of us. The refreshing was here. The strengthening was here. The unity was here. The empowering was here. The moving of the Holy Ghost was going to be here, but you showed up. And now you're fresh, you're you're renewed, you're strengthened. It was going to come either way, but just make up your mind. I've got to get to the house of the Lord. I've got to be where he's moving. I've got to be what's what he involved with what he's going to be doing. Hallelujah. When the altar comes, just show up. An altar calls coming, just show up. Just just make your, your mind to get out of your seat. And I've got to take 5, 10, 3, 4, 20 steps to get there. But just show up because God is not done with what he started here this night. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah, Isaiah 6 and 8. He says, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send or who will go for us? Then said I, here am I. Send me. I'll show up. And he said, go. He wasn't looking for anybody specifically. Who's going to go? I'll show up. Perfect. Go. The best ability is availability. Do you have that ability just availability. Do you have that ability to just show up? Hallelujah. And allow God to use you. Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was on the way. Climb a tree. I'm too short to see him through the crowds, but I'm going to show up. Climbed a tree, saw Jesus. Jesus walking by says, hey, I'm going to eat dinner in your house today because he showed up. The man born of four, he was paralyzed. Could have make up his mind to somehow he was going to show up. Or his four friends were like, no, you're going to show up. They heard that Jesus was in the house, took him to the roof, began to tear it apart, let him down by a little rope. Hey, he couldn't even walk. They said, we're making sure you show up because Jesus is in the house. And when Jesus saw their faith... Take up your bed and walk. Let's go. Because he showed up. And sometimes that's all it takes. That's all God desires of you. Just be here. You don't, you don't have to understand the Bible so great. You don't have to, uh, I mean, you don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be the greatest prayer warrior. You don't have to have written books. You don't need any degrees. But can you just show up? Can you just be there? Hallelujah. When he wants to, when he says, uh, when he returns, will he find faith on the earth? Will there be somebody that just shows up and says, Lord, I will be faithful. Hallelujah. My mom, in the year prior to, she died in, in 99, January 99, and that year prior, 98, um, for the previous couple years, we hadn't been able to get to church because my dad wasn't really going. My mom couldn't really drive. She had 
lupus and it uh, attacks your body. And so her body wasn't functioning the way a normal, I'm 39, the way my body would at 39. Her, her body was working as if she was like 139. And she would, her outfit was just gray sweats and like a maroon pocket t-shirt. That's all she could manage to put on. That's the only strength she had to wear. Sometimes she'd mix it up for a blue t-shirt, but that's, that's all she could muster up to put on. She walked with a cane, 38 years old. She couldn't really eat much. We couldn't go out to restaurants anymore. There's a very limited amount of things that she could eat. Um, we had to be careful when she did eat because if the, the dishes were washed wrong, it would make her very, very sick. We had to wash with scorching water and uh, a lot of soap. So we had to be very careful with her. There's, she, was very, her she was very fragile. There wasn't a lot that she could do. There wasn't a lot of strength that she had. And sometime in 98, I remember it, we're at, we, she made up her mind to get to the sanctuary at the church on Yosemite. And coming into that building, the entry you enter in from this side in this corner. And I remember walking behind her as she would reach the threshold of just walking into the sanctuary, say from that door, as if you would pass just through the doors. And as soon as she passed just through the doors, the Spirit of God fell on her, just hit her. She began to cry and lift up her hands as best that she could. And I heard her talk in tongues and God move over and sweep over and fill her with the Holy Ghost and so much that I could feel it just like radiating off of her. And it um, touched me in a way and I, and it was just that she made it into the house of the Lord. Didn't hear the preaching. There was probably, there was singing time. But just the sanctuary, just getting to the house of the Lord. And she limped her way in there and God gave her everything that she needed. That night, I believe she got the strength that she needed to move on through that next year. And through that next year, Everything that she was going through, every time I heard her pray, it was never for herself or for healing. It was always for her children and for her family. Because she made up her mind just to show up. Martin Luther King said, if you can't walk or run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But you have to keep moving forward. She wasn't able to get her church clothes on and look beautiful and nice to come into the house of the Lord and to present herself in that way. But you have to keep moving forward. You might not have it all together. Oh, child of God, son of God, daughter of God, man of God, a woman of God, you might not have it all together. But just keep moving forward where you are. The woman with the issue of the blood. If I can just touch the hem of his garment. I don't have to talk to him. I don't have to stop him. I don't have to get his attention. But if I can just crawl through. And show up where he's walking. I shall be made whole. Jesus, when she does, he turns to her and says, your faith has made you whole. You made up your mind to just show up. 